Good morning to everybody. Uh, welcome here. It's nice that you came here after the yesterday events. Uh, so uh, my talk, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank to the organizers for, for inviting me for this conference. I'm here for the first time, but I must say that it's really very interesting conference. So today I would like to share my expertise in modeling coupled chemo hydrothermomechanical phenomena. In particular, I would like to tell you about modeling uh, material damage induced by crystallizing phases, that is salt crystallization and frost damage, which can be modeled using non-equilibrium approach. I noticed that almost all uh, presenters here are using an equilibrium approach, so maybe I can show you another possibility. Um, co-authors of my presentations are my colleagues from my department, Dr. Marcin Koniorczyk and Professor Francesco Pesavento from the University of Padova. I have a long-lasting collaboration with the University of Padova with a group of Professor Schreffler at least 20 years. So usually I'm responsible for the physical aspects of modeling and my talk will be devoted more to uh, physical aspects than to uh, numerical things. Of course, uh, I will tell us about modeling. In nature, very often we meet situations where we can observe chemical damage of building materials. Uh, for example, due to uh, leaching, due to salt crystallization, and sometimes also due, so, uh, due to frost damage and sometimes uh, due to other chemical reactions like, for example, alkali silica reaction or delayed tringate formation and so on. So uh, th this subject is of importance, hence uh, many researchers devoted uh, their research to that. In my presentation, I will present you a, br a brief summary of the model developed together with the group of University of Padova, which allows to model coupled chemo-hydrothermomechanical processes. Uh, then I will uh, tell something about some key chemo-hydrothermomechanical couplings which should be taken into account. Then I will describe non-equilibrium approach to modeling of crystallization in uh, porous materials. And finally, I will present you application of this approach to uh, frost damage and uh, crystallization of uh, salts in uh, building materials. As I mentioned previously, uh, the subject is of importance, hence uh, a lot of research was devoted to this topic in recent years. And uh, usually, when we model coupled uh, hydrothermal chemomechanical processes, usually, uh, say these uh, first uh, three words are taken into account. That means people consider hydrothermal couplings or hydrothermomechanical couplings. But when you deal with chemical degradation, you should also consider uh, couplings with chemical phenomena which uh, uh, induce uh, more complicated formulations. So in my talk, I will, de I will uh, consider only meso and macro models because this approach can be applied for in this case. Uh, building materials, usually I porous materials, uh, the uh, pores of which are uh, filled with different phases of water. And depending on the temperature, uh, do you have maybe a... I'm sorry. I cannot see. Thank you. This one. Okay. So depending on the temperature, the moisture can be in liquid, in gas, or in solid phase. And uh, I will consider all those three phases present in the pores of the material. So when we are dealing with, uh, with uh, building materials, we must consider both solid phases, 
uh, except of the solid skeleton, we can have in the pores uh, ice or crystallized salt. Then we have liquid phases, which can be physically adsorbed water or capillary water, and uh, gas phases, which is a mixture of dry air and water vapor. Of course, they must fulfill the well-known uh, relation uh, that the sum of their saturation degree must be equal to one. Uh, when we deal with those materials, we should consider phase changes of water uh, and energy effects associated with them, which give us s some source terms in mass, uh, mass balance and energy balance. So we have evaporation or condensation for in lower relative humidities adsorption and desorption, but when we deal with uh, temperatures below zero degrees Celsius, we must also take into account thawing and freezing of, uh, of water and sublimation and the sublimation of uh, vapor. Then when we deal with chemical reactions, for example, leaching, which is a very often source of uh, chemicals in the pore solution, uh, and with salt precipitation or salt dissolution, we have also similar uh, sources of uh, mass and energy, because uh, these effects uh, can be uh, should be taken into account. Uh, in modeling of uh, transport uh, of different uh, species, we must take uh, into account different mechanism of those transports. So capillary water can flow due to advective flow, but if salt is present, we can have also osmotic flow, which is of importance uh, in the materials with very narrow pores, like for example, concrete. Uh, then, uh, on the uh, surface of uh, the skeleton, we can have surface diffusion flow of adsorbed water. Uh, water vapor can uh, be transported due to uh, pressure gradients, that is, in this way we have advective flow, but also due to diffusive flow. Uh, similar uh, mechanism uh, should be considered for dry air, and when we deal with ions, we can have also some uh, new mechanism of transport related to, uh, for example, thermodiffusional flow and dispersive flow. In uh, our modeling, up to now, we are not considering electrical field. Uh, so, uh, the starting point uh, to the, in development of the model are balance equations and at the micro scale. Then, after application of uh, the well-known uh, volume averaging uh, operators, we finish up with some uh, macro-scale balance equations. Uh, our approach uh, follows the so-called hybrid mixture theory. So, uh, we consider the local balance equations for mass, linear momentum, angular momentum, energy, and entropy, which give us some constraints for uh, constitutive relations. So, uh, in our model, uh, we must, of course, to have the same number of equations as unknowns. So, uh, usually, we consider the dry air mass balance, where the state variable is or the state variable associated with this is gas pressure. Then we have uh, water species mass balance, uh, where uh, the moisture content is described in terms of capillary pressure uh, in its extended sense ex in fully saturation. Uh, this can be considered as an overpressure of, of water. Then when we deal with salt transport, we have uh, salt mass balance equation uh, where the associated uh, state variable is concentration of chemical species. Then uh, we have energy balance with temperature. Of course, as I mentioned before, electrical field is not considered and the uh, multi-phase uh, medium momentum balance is described in terms of displacement vector. Uh, when we deal with uh, some uh, additional processes, we need also some evolution equations. Uh, 
So for the mechanical damage, we have associated evol uh, evolution equation for that, where the parameter uh, describing its progress is damage parameter. Then we can have uh, some uh, variable describing advancement of chemical reactions, which will be called uh, degree of reaction advancement. And we can have also some chemical damage described in terms of chemical damage parameter. Uh, th the last one is used, for example, for leaching, alkali silica reaction, and salt crystallization. Uh, the form of those equations is usual, I would say. Uh, I just would want to mention that we are using the solid skeleton mass balance uh, in other equations to eliminate the derivative of uh, porosity with respect to, uh, to time. Uh, we consider we are using a usual strain decomposition into different components. Uh, we are uh, working with the, um, uh, with the incremental form of this uh, uh, the strain decomposition. So we consider the mechanical strain, which in our case mean also strains caused by shrinkage uh, of, uh, mat of the material because for describing uh, the shrinkage we are using effective stress principle. Then we are considering the uh, creep, thermal, and chemical strains. So, uh, so the effective stress principle uh, was uh, which we are using was formulated by Gray and Schreffler where this uh, coefficient dependent on the degree of saturation is, uh, the fa is found, is determined from the experimental data. And uh, it gives a good uh, agreement with experiments. Uh, then for creep, we are using modified solidification theory where in, instead of some uh, say, physically not well-defined uh, parameters used in the original theory by Bajant and co-workers, we directly use effective stresses and hydration degree. For drying creep, we are using microprostress theory, and this allows us to obtain a good, uh, uh, say, agreement with experimental data, and at the same time, we are able to model uh, the picket effect. That means that the some of the deformations, uh, say uh, shri pure shrinkage and uh, the uh, creep and uh, uh, deformation due to external stress of the sealed uh, sample, the sum of those two is smaller than the observed uh, value of, uh, the, of strains where both uh, factors uh, are present in parallel. That means during drying and uh, external load. For modeling damage, we are using non-local isotropic damage theory. Uh, so uh, this non-local formulation gives us, say, regularization in, in space, but in, uh, in for the examples I am going to show, we, we are using delayed damage theory in the rate formulation. Which, which is using also a kind of regularization in time. Thanks to that, uh, we obtain a much better numerical performance. This theory was uh, developed by Sufis and co-workers at the beginning of the years 2000. Uh, for description of chemical damage, we are using an uh, approach proposed by Pijodier Cabot with co-workers. Uh, because it is easy to combine the two damage mechanism in, uh, that is mechanical damage, which is cracking of the material and this chemical caused by uh, chemical reactions or chemical phenomena, uh, which uh, can, are, uh, where the damage parameter is defined in terms of young modulus of uh, a sound and damage material. Uh, so th the joint effect of those two is described in the, by the following in the following form. So we can consider that uh, in modeling of uh, stresses. Uh, 
Of course, damage induces uh, some uh, increase of permeability. We are taking this into account in phenomenological way, uh, considering experimental data uh, giving us uh, information about increase of this permeability due to dam uh, material damage. Uh, this increase can be quite significant, even three, four orders of magnitude. Uh, our equations are solved in quite classical way. So for discretization in, sp in space, we are using finite elements. For temporal discretization, finite differences. And uh, after linearization of the problem, we are solving it using a, a multifrontal solver. Here you can see an example of the equations uh, for uh, where the first one describes uh, gas transport, the second one moisture transport. Uh, this is the energy balance, chemical species transport, and uh, equilibrium equation. We are using, we are neglecting uh, the, uh, the mass forces here. And uh, those equations can be written in shorter form as follows, where you can see easily that the equations are coupled, and this is very strong coupling. In practice, all fields are coupled together, are coupled one with another. So uh, for finite difference uh, discretization, we are using generalized midpoint rule, usually fully implicit scheme, which give us the best convergence of the solution. and the final, after linearization, the final equation set is solved using monolithic approach and uh, based on that we developed our own codes. They are called, uh, the older version are called AMTRA and the codes developed at my uh, department and here in Padova they are called COMES uh, code. Uh, let me show you no, now you some experimental uh, results which are used in modeling. So uh, here you can see the scheme showing the idea uh, of multi-scale mercury intrusion porosimetry. During the first intrusion, we are filling up gradually smaller and smaller pores with increasing uh, mercury pressure. During extrusion, uh, the part of, uh, of this mercury remains in so-called ink bottle pores. So during the second intrusion, only the rest of the pores is filled with uh, the mercury. Using this, we can uh, define so-called ink bottle contribution, and this gives us information about volume of those pores in, in the uh, medium. Then, just to see what happens with transport properties, we are using a simple here, not only, uh, I'm going to show you the results of simple capillary suction test, when we measure increase of, uh, uh, of the mass of the sample, which is put in, into the, in water, and it sucks water, and uh, this increase of mass is proportional to the square root of time, and this coefficient is called capillary suction coefficient. So if we see the results for uh, the uh, mortar, uh, cement mortar, with different amount of uh, air attritement agent uh, after 0, 25, and 50 cycles of freezing thawing, we can see that the total porosity is almost unchanged during uh, this uh, damage. However, uh, we can observe that uh, here there is the uh, original, uh, say, uh, curve, mercury uh, obtained uh, uh, pore size distribution curve, and this is after uh, damaging. We observe that the pores in certain range of diameters, their volume increases, uh, at least in, 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 the, in this curve. That means that the narrow necks connecting the ink bottle pores uh, 
uh, are uh, opened and uh, were damaged due to the frost action. So uh, here are the same results for uh, same material which has uh, another poor structure where the, uh, the behavior of the material is much better uh, thanks to the proper uh, composition of uh, pores. Uh, and uh, if you look into capillary suction coefficient, we can see that uh, this increased quite heavily. You can see here four times, also the same here. That means that during uh, frost damaging, uh, we observe a significant increase of material permeability, uh, which was also measured in our lab. Similar phenomena can be observed du during salt crystallization. So, uh, usually during uh, this uh, cyclic crystallization, uh, we observe a small increase of uh, uh, porosity, however, uh, a significant change of pore size distribution. It is increase of s uh, pores of in some region, and of course we observe uh, say, decrease of contribution of those ink bottle pores. So, uh, let me tell something about thermodynamics of the porous medium. So, uh, when we, uh, usually in modeling, we are assuming the equilibrium state. That means that the um, corresponding uh, that this grand canonical potential reaches its minimum. And uh, we should have in the medium buff mechanical equilibrium, which give us the relation for the pressure difference caused by uh, surface tension between phases. And of course, we need also uh, uh, equilibrium, which means that the chemical potentials of phases must be the same. So, for example, if we deal with equilibrium between vapor and, uh, for example, ice, uh, putting into the relation some uh, equations, we obtain uh, a well-known Kelvin equation uh, for the case when uh, ice is present in the pores, of course, similar equation can be obtained also for water. And if we deal with equilibrium between ice and water, we obtain a well-known relation uh, between the, this pressure difference and the, uh, say, uh, overcooling of the material. That is the difference of the uh, freezing uh, temperature in, in the pores of certain uh, radius uh, with respect to the freezing temperature of the free water. Uh, so, uh, using this, we can obtain a well-known relations describing the, uh, say, uh, dependence of the uh, relative humidity or capillary pressure on the pore radius and decrease of freezing temperature in smaller pores. The smaller pores are, the lower is freezing temperature. And those two relations are usually uh, applied in modeling. However, in reality, if we want to observe, uh, if we want to model, or we, if we want to obtain, uh, say, uh, the uh, free, uh, phase change, we need uh, this uh, thermodynamic uh, non-equilibrium state. So, in such a state, the rate of entropic creation is proportional to the uh, product of the uh, thermodynamic flows and gradients of and gradient of thermodynamic forces. In the case of phase transition or phase change. Uh, the uh, flow in this case means the progress of chemical or uh, phase change described in terms of uh, degree of advancement of freezing, for example, and uh, this proportional ratio is uh, affinity, chemical affinity. 
So, if the thermodynamic flow can be described, it is usually uh, proportional to this coefficient here, we obtain the following form describing the progress of freezing and after some algebra we can obtain also uh, the uh, uh, relation describing this affinity. Uh, so, uh, we must consider that freezing and thawing of water takes place in slightly different conditions because the curvature between the two phases is different. And uh, because of this we obtained different relation showing us the water content in the pores as a function of uh, supercooling temperature. I mean, the difference between the, uh, say, uh, temp zero degrees Celsius minus the temperature of freezing of water in, in certain pores. Uh, those relations are well known and widely used. Uh, and uh, this is confirmed also by experimental data. So, if we perform uh, the, uh, if we measure phase change in uh, differential scanning calorimeter, we obtain different curve for freezing and, and thawing, even if the temperature decrease is very, very slow in both direction. That means that uh, there is a difference between those two phenomena, and if we are using only the equilibrium curve, usually that which is uh, obtained by, uh, for flowing, we can, observe, we can obtain results which are different from, uh, say, from nature, from reality, physical reality. And uh, so, uh, why we observe this difference? Uh, during uh, f uh, during uh, uh, freezing, we have intrusion of uh, non-wetting phase or less wetting phase, in this case it is uh, ice, in which enters the pores which are filled up with water. And uh, during this process the curvature is, uh, we must consider the curvature of this uh, interface. But during uh, condensation, we have opposite situation. Uh, during melting, excuse me, thawing, we have opposite situation. So the initially pores are filled with uh, ice, and there is a very small uh, layer, layer of very uh, of small thickness on the surface of the skeleton, and immediately uh, this the wetting phase enters. So, in the previous case, there is some additional uh, energy barrier which must be overcome. For, for this reason, uh, during, uh, during freezing, we need usually a uh, lower temperature uh, to start freezing than during thawing. And this can be considered using non-equilibrium approach. So, uh, after some transformation, we can express this degree of freezing as a difference, as a function of the so-called equilibrium uh, capillary pressure for freezing, uh, which is uh, related to the actual uh, temperature in the medium, or the difference between the uh, melting temperature of free water and actual temperature in the pores, and the actual value of capillary pressure, uh, which in reality is a normal capillary pressure multiplied by the ratio of surface tensions between water and ice and water and uh, vapor. So, in this way we have uh, the, the expression for the source of mass and source of energy, which is expressed in terms of temperature and capillary pressure. So we can solve the problem. Uh, due to different, uh, say, uh, these equilibrium uh, conditions for freezing and melting, we have different curves, these equilibrium curves for freezing and, and uh, flowing. 
but we can also take into account experimental data from this uh, differential scanning calorimeter and use, for example, this curve, which give us a more realistic description. Because uh, for this curve, it was assumed that the pores were cylindrical, which is maybe not very correct uh, f uh, from the real, uh, point of view of uh, physics. And um, say, uh, in this way, we can use the same uh, uh, relations for water and uh, vapor transport, but considering that the water is present in the smallest pore, because freezing always starts from uh, larger pores, and gradually enters uh, smaller and smaller pores. Thanks to that, we can use the same relations, and but consider the actual value of uh, water saturation in the pores. Uh, uh, for uh, diffusion of water vapor, we must take into account that uh, for this diffusion, only part of pores is available. So uh, we, here we take uh, we consider. Uh, the space which is one, uh, say, porosity minus uh, those two uh, degree of saturation with water and with ice. During freezing uh, and, uh, or uh, during crystallization in general, we observe some uh, crystallization pressure uh, which is a result of uh, different, uh, different curvature of the wall, uh, poor uh, wall, RB, and entrance uh, curvature. And uh, this uh, can be expressed as follows. Uh, and uh, if we consider the experimental uh, data for this ratio between those two uh, ready uh, or uh, curvatures, uh, they can be determined from this uh, differential calori calorimetry, we can use a more realistic description of crystallization pressure. <coughs> so, uh, after integration, following the uh, approach proposed by Scherer, but also other researchers propose similar relationships, we can obtain the average crystallization pressure uh, exerted on the uh, uh, surface of the pores. And here you can see the relations obtained for uh, uh, one measured uh, um, pore uh, structure. And for assuming that lambda is taken from experimental data or lambda is taken, this parameter lambda, as I described previously, equal to 0.1. So that is assuming that entering we have uh, the spherical, uh, say, this uh, uh, interface and uh, or during melting we have cylindrical interface. Uh, so if we have partially saturated material using this relation, we can calculate the, uh, say, the average crystallization pressure as a difference between the values for this uh, relation taken for the actual value of saturation degree and uh, uh, for the sum of saturation degree with water and ice. Of course, the highest value are obtained when the uh, material is fully saturated with water and ice. Okay. Oh, I'm. Okay. So here you can see uh, the, the different curves, uh, structural curves, and the uh, say the value of this crystallization pressure obtained for them. Uh, now uh, a few words about uh, numerical aspects. Uh, the parameter of the model shown previously is characteristic time of freezing and melting, and uh, of course, it influences the numerical performance and the results. Uh, so uh, we were able to calculate, uh, to obtain a solution uh, for very small uh, characteristic time, for example, 15 seconds. But for two seconds, we obtained some oscillations which are characteristic 
uh, for uh, which uh, can be uh, usually are obtained using a uh, equilibrium approach. So uh, let me show now uh, uh, the validation of the model. Here you can see the results of differential calorimetry, uh, which I showed you before, and using this uh, approach, assuming different M parameter in Van Genuchten relation for relative permeability of liquid, we obtain, first of all, this kisteretic, uh, uh, say, behavior and quite good agreement with experimental data. Uh, so, uh, maybe I will show also th those results. Uh, when uh, so uh, we measured the structure, pore structure of the material after several cycles of freezing and thawing, and we determined the uh, damage parameter. Using that, we defined the crystallization pressure as a function of temperature and damage coefficient, and we were able to model the cyclic freezing thawing of the material and uh, obtain the gradual progress of the damage. Uh, if uh, we assumed, uh, if we uh, didn't consider those, uh, say, coupling between the structure and freezing, the damage parameter was constant. So it was not possible to obtain agreement. Similar approach can be applied also for modeling uh, salts, uh, transport, uh, the, this osmotic pressure is of importance, especially for concrete. And uh, let me show now those results. Uh, so the uh, rate of uh, crystallization of salt is proportional to the uh, difference between the actual value of uh, concentration of salt species and the maximum uh, possible at a certain temperature and uh, the crystallization pressure can be expressed in terms of activity of chemicals. Uh, it, can be sh it should be shown that th this crystallization pressure is higher in, uh, higher in uh, larger pores, and the results for uh, crystallization in brick wall and concrete wall, uh, here moisture content profiles, uh, Supersaturation. So uh, crystallization occurs only if uh, th uh, the actual ratio between the salt saturation content is higher than maximum possible at certain temperature. So crystallization takes place only here, and uh, due to that we obtain uh, different crystallization pressure. And finally, the last thing which I want to show is the uh, say development of the damage, which is in this case it's observed only on the surface because during crystallization of salt, salt crystallizes only on the surface. So uh, similar approach can be applied also for uh, leaching of chemicals. I, we already published several papers on that. Uh, the incremental or rate uh, formulation of alkali silica reaction or dilated ringgit form form uh, formation can be also uh, uh, used. And thanks to that, uh, we are able to avoid some, uh, say, numerical problems, uh, uh, to avoid convergence problems during uh, the phase change. And in natural way, we obtain hysteretic effects, which in the normal approach must be uh, assumed at the very beginning and that needs a lot of experimental work. Thank you very much for your attention and sorry. That